sometimes when we look at these diseases, they're being used as models for um, uh, examples of common disease or rare disease or whatever. So do you see it as being modeling of a disease, or can an investigator come in with a very, very specific disease focus that isn't necessarily um, relevant to other disease types? Because I think that makes a big difference. Yeah, so I, I think uh, I'll start. <laughs> you can. We haven't actually discussed this in depth about which, what types of diseases we would study. I think we would like to see these as models for other diseases because we do want to ge develop a generalizable approach. But I think you know, we'd be open to a particular uh, disease that was particularly compelling because of samples or other existing data. Does that seem? Yes. Having said that, we, I think we are especially interested in the generalizable components that could be learned. And while one might study two very different disorders, which have very different biology and phenotype, with respect to how best to study the genetic role of that disorder, how best to learn which variants are important, there we think there could be a lot of generalizability. Eric. So I have a clarifying question that other people may have, but I'll ask now. What's the difference between the computational analysis center and the data analysis center in the coordinating center? I, I'm confused about that. Could you clarify, please? Yeah, I'll start and then I can turn over to my colleagues. So, um, the data analysis center is really going to be focused on creating the encyclopedia, analyzing the data that's been submitted, and figuring out how how um, how we can actually annotate the genome to uh, for, for identifying the functional elements. The computational analysis groups are really the ideas, best ideas from the researchers about how to um, enhance and, and you learn, derive biological insights to learn about disease develop new, new methodologies. Lon? I had, um, I had a similar question as, as Eric in general scope there. So the data, the complexity of the data will only increase from this because you've got the functional characterization and so on. And, and I, the uh, computational, the new scheme in computational is investigator initiated, so that's, that's very good. But you're focusing, there's less in the data analysis center, right? Mm -hmm. So it, did the discussions from the working group and other, is there sufficient analytical horsepower behind the data generation given the greater complexity? Right. So um, I think we were considering that for um, recognizing that there's already a pretty large budget and, and some of this analysis can be, um, uh, we want to get the data out there so the community can analyze it. But I think your point is well taken that we do have new data types coming in that may require um, uh, different kinds of analyses early on in understanding really what the data is, is um, saying. So I don't know, Dan or Mike, if you want to say anything in addition? So I would just add to that that part of the ENCODE philosophy is that the data are out there as a resource for the community. People use the data in very different ways. So part of the analysis is use specific individual users say, I need to get this out of the data and then they extract it. We don't think we could pre-compute all of that for everybody. We do some of the basic data processing like uniformly process the data, call elements and so forth. So just a general comment, I want to express my enthusiasm for the transition from cataloging to using the information in the translational aspect. It's, it's challenging. It's enormously challenging. But I think you all and the ENCODE investigators and the advisor, you know, the workshop you've had is pushing that envelope as much as you can, I, I think is greatly beneficial. And one other comment is you, you emphasized in several places of community engagement, which again I think is very important going forward. But the emphasis tends to be on samples and data. The community has samples and data. I would encourage you to have focus groups and get questions from the community so you, so the ENCODE investigators, whoever is funded in the next round, are working on relevant problems for the community. So, and, and again, that's going to be challenging because investigators tend to be focused on a particular tissue or a particular assay. But again, I think as much as 
it can be pushed to work on problems that are relevant to the community, I think is very important going forward. And, and I'll just put in a, a shameless plug right now for the users meeting that we're going to be having uh, the end of Ju uh, June and beginning of July that Eric referred to. Um, I think part of that is we, we do want to get input from the research community about the utility of the resource and how we can improve that. And if people are interested in um, that workshop, you can go to encode2015.org and register. It's my shameless plug. So. <laughs> so can we now move on to go back to the specific initiatives? Hey, Rudy, how would you like to do this? Are there specific comments or questions about Initiative 1? <clears throat> so I, li I like this very much. Um, and I just would ask that uh, the focus on mouse I completely understand. Um, but I would be more comfortable if, if it was written in a way that if somebody came in with an interesting idea, uh, that wasn't mouse centric and they could justify it and it was good science that that was enabled rather than restricting it to an organism when because you're trying to capture more ideas I completely understand that there's a lot of data in there so it'd be hard to imagine that but I always liked where there's a flexibility that someone could put an idea in that we hadn't thought about I mean so are you are you saying that we could expand mouse or are you saying we'd be open to other organisms I think somebody could come in I would say other organisms if there's a really, really good justification. I mean. Yeah. So how was that worded in the past? It had to be that the 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 new model organism had to somehow enable discovery in the human or well so in the previous round of, of ENCODE what we did was we had it we didn't have it wide open. We had the the um, initiative in twenty twelve was for prime first priority for human, second on mouse, and then continuing modern code fly and worm if it was very well justified. But yes, it didn't have to um, uh, support the analysis of the um, human genome. Bringing in additional model organisms creates a whole lot of other um, challenges for the data coordination and analysis center. Um, I don't know if, if Mike or Dan want to comment on that um, or other other. So I, I just, knowledgeable people. So I'll be more specific. I mean, I think zebrafish uh, is becoming a more and more common model that's being used to rapidly assess functionality. And so I just feel like that would be another place where it could come in. But I mean, I understand it makes a com complex environment, but I just don't like restricting if we can avoid restricting. Carol? Okay, so I think the, I think where that comes in, Howard, is more on the functional characterization of the elements, but I don't think you're saying that you want to create a functional element catalog, you want to add another organism to the catalog part of this, so I think this initiative is more about defining the functional elements. So because of the amount of funds, if you put that over too many organisms, now you don't do a deep enough character you know, cataloging effort. But I think the characterization part did include any model organism as long as it was fully justified. So I think maybe these are different. So uh, so I, I understand that. I'm just, I just always find it uncomfortable when we restrict it to something. So I don't know how somebody would go in and map this and make this effective. Um, but if you don't allow ideas, we don't have a chance to get the ideas. I think you can say that it's, you know, I think you can put, there'd have to be some really special reasons why there'd be another idea. So how would you do that if you had one, one that was doing one data type in one organism, one that was doing another data type in another organism, and then you want us to fund five different organisms and competing with, with the human and mouse going under the same egg cack? It um, seems a little daunting. Uh, my concern also is that uh, so I, I understand your point, but my concern also is you don't want people putting a lot of time in writing proposals. I mean, what is fully justified or well justified? And I, I just worry a little bit about that part of it. On the other hand, I can, you could put in here any organisms eligible as long as it's really well justified, and then they have to contact um, the program staff 
to really see if they can pull it off. But I would put in here, strongly encouraged to contact program staff before you go down this road if it's other than mouse and human. Perfect. Uh, we, have, we have a couple of our council members who we had wanted to lead the discussion. Jay and Eric. Jay, did you? Yeah. And I can chime in. So I, 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 agree, I tend to agree with Carol and specifically for that reason. I think if, you know, particularly that we're already at 90-10 human mouse, which I think is something that merits discussion. Further diluting it is challenging. And also, um, if there's a programmatic desire to not fund more than human and mouse, then probably having people put in that work doesn't make sense unless they contact the, the program officers, officers first. Uh, so I'll just, I'll just make a, a more general comment, which is I, I thought the workshop was outstanding. I was there, but I wasn't one of the organizers. And just hats off to um, Carol and Eric and the other organizers of that. And then also to, to Mike and Elise, I feel like the, um, the concept document that came out here really closely um, echoed or matched, I think, a lot of the, what the main themes were at the, um, the workshop. And, and you did a great job, I think, of, of capturing it. Uh, on, this, on this first uh, uh, concept, I think, or, or this first, this first subpart, um, you know, it, m some of my questions that I, I think I still have, which I, I think have come up a little bit before, but um, can you remind us with, you know, it, from like a 2012 perspective when the funding was at the same level, is this a smaller pot that's going to mapping relative to the other parts? Um, that's one. And then two, I was wondering if, and I had a little trouble remembering, are there specific functional, uh, specific um, data types that you have in mind that have not been captured to date that are high on the priority list? Or is it more kind of we want to keep things open in case people have a great idea? There's a lot of questions <laughs> in there. So um, for FY12, the uh, data production mapping centers had $22 million. Um, in, in activities that were ones that were continuing on through. We had a couple of bridge fundings where we actually we closed out actually some, or we can bridge some of the modern code projects. So the money was a little bit more. Um, but the 22 million was for the mapping. And then that, that went down actually to 19.2 and then currently is 18.5. Smaller fraction would be devoted to mapping per round. And then I guess the other question was whether you had specific activities and or specific um, assays in mind to, to consider adding or whether it was more of an open call. So I think we are open to new ones. I think we in the concept clearance we specifically did talk about mapping all transcription factors and at least two cell types. I think that was laid out there. But I think we're definitely open for new technologies, new methodologies that maybe um, have uh, better information content, higher throughput, uh, more cost effective. Um, you know, we can imagine supporting more of long-range interactions because that we don't support a lot of that now. We know that that's very useful. So we're open to all of those. I mean, the, the field is rapidly changing. So I think we would be um, foolish to be too narrow to start. Yeah, I, I just wanted to echo the comments of Jay about the, the meeting. I thought the presentation of um, captured very well what was discussed at the meeting. Um, I, I also um, wanted to, 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 to comment on Howard's concern. I think the idea of using other model organisms within that functional category is, wi is wide open it's for the next, the, the second thing that we'll talk about, the second RFA. Um, I think within that, it's fairly broad. I think that, that would probably be the place to really explore model organisms, which I highly support. Within this particular mapping, you know, the prescription of some ratio of mouse to human, I think it's difficult to try to get your arms around that because some of the disease focus, for example, in the mouse might be fetal, right? So you might have transgenic mouse models that mimic a disease and you want to use that as your model system. But if that's in fetal, that wouldn't be part of the plan, I guess. So I just wanted to throw out the, the, the idea that the both the mapping resolution as well as um, the disease models could encounter stages of development which might not be um, covered in the existing description of the of the center, and that we should be wide open to 
to, to those kinds of possibilities. One second. Bob Nussbaum, are you on the phone? Did you have comments? I am on the phone, and uh, I, I had no, no issues with this first functional element mapping center. Um, most of what I have to say is about two, three, and four. Okay, we'll bring you back then. So I, I, um, I find the proposal, the concept, very interesting. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm daunted. I find daunting the dimension, the the infinite dimensionality, and I'm, you know, the uh, uh, several times during the the write up, you have this. Uh, very uh, carefully chosen phrase about bounding the space or something like that, right? And so, um, but I, I guess I'm wondering in, in sort of, uh, you know, executing this, how you actually deal with the infinite dimensionality of things. So you just mentioned it would be great to map all transcription factors in two cell lines. Well, okay, there's an all. Well, <laughs> just to point out, that, that very sentence sort of illustrates the problem. And then if I think about, okay, and you're going to convey, you're going to translate that into a disease space. So I'm sort of wondering, what is a disease sample? Is a disease sample a cell line? Obviously, there are only certain diseases from which you can meaningfully derive cell lines. Are we talking about tissue samples? How do you map transcription factor binding sites from two cell lines, how do you actually connect that in any meaningful way to disease studies? And so I, I'm just, I, I'm, enth I'm very enthusiastic, but I, I'm just thinking about operationally, how do you reduce the infinite dimensionality of this thing into something that applicants and reviewers can, um, can handle? Yeah, I, I think that that's uh, a really great question. Um, so the idea of this sort of uh, very, very large matrix, it's overwhelming as we've come up against before, and this was discussed in the workshop. Uh, and one of the ideas that was brought out was that if you could sort of aggressively dimensionality reduce the matrix and identify you know, different elements, key cell types, key disease samples that would sort of maximize your ability to impute to other other spaces of this matrix that that would, um, to, to make it more generalizable, that that would be a, a sort of conceptual direction you go. I mean, how do you do that practically? That's a research question. There are a couple ideas that were sort of brought up at the workshop. Um, one idea was just to get the data where you can get the data, you know, get the, the samples that are easiest to study first, and then model based on that and try to identify areas of the matrix where you can extrapolate to. A another suggestion was to start out with a modeling component where you uh, try to figure out how to impute to some of these areas of this matrix, see where your models break down, realize that now we need samples in this area, and sort of do iterations of that to identify regions of this matrix that you might fill in. Um, but this is a, a, a great question. And I think the idea was that we would have the applicants make a proposal, and then the group would come together and strategize not only the mapping centers, but also the, the EDCAC um, as well. Jay, you wanted to? Oh, I'm sorry, Carol. Jay and Carol. So the bounding question, as Dan pointed out, came up many times during the workshop. And I think in the end, there were many different viewpoints in the participants about how, the, how that bounding could happen. And a lot of it was dependent on the biological question at hand. And so I think in this concept document, the issues brought up without a specific solution because the idea would be that the investigators would have to justify that what they're proposing has a reasonable bound on it, rather than imposing a particular strategy for that bounding here specifically, it would be left as a principle upon which the proposals would be evaluated. That was my recollection. Let me just, I'm just sort of uh, echoing things that I 
I think of cir sort of circle around this this table fairly frequently. We talk about actually we talk about as a council and actually the language of, of um, these clearances talks about the need to sort of expand the tent to bring more people, uh, you know, more investigators into the mix. And um, uh, Carol, I like what you've just said, but I, I want to flip it around and say um, just framing this as a grantsmanship challenge. Um, this strikes me as being an enormous challenge for people who are not inside the tent to read the comments that you just made, Carol, <laughs> about how, uh, you know, there's so many sort of unspecified uh, variables, yet there will be, as always occurs in a study section, the right answers emerge, right? And so um, this strikes me as, a, as posing an enormous grantsmanship challenge for people who are not already completely inside the tent to figure out, okay, what is going to satisfy a study section uh, with all of these unspecified dimensions. And I mean people with great ideas and great biological insights having to navigate and chart these, uh, these grantsmanship waters. It's the classic problem, right? You don't want to define things so tightly that you leave things, you leave people out, but yet you have to define it well enough that people can know how to respond. I think it's a classic problem. I wish I had a specific answer. We can also have a, a broader discussion of this, I think, big, big challenge with a uh, broader swath of the community as well to come up with ideas. Other questions or comments about initiative, on Joe? Let, let me just comment. I think the the user workshop that, that will have a great opportunity to get input about the kinds of things the community is doing and would like to see. There may be unique opportunities. I think that was part of the discussion we had, where some systems may be you know really ripe to study some developmental process. Let's say just cells in a dish that are differentiated and there's a disease model that you can overlay on top of that that's been well validated and that could be, you know, that could be a, a collaboration between those expert labs that have spent, you know, 20 years developing that particular model to then put that into the pipeline. So that would be one example, I think, of how you could, you could be opportunistic. A five-second rule. If no one jumps in, then it's time to take an action. So, um, can I get a motion to uh, accept or approve uh, concept uh, initiative number one? In a second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you, Bob. All right. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. On to initiative two, then. This is Bob. Could I speak up about non initiative two? Sure. Why don't you lead us off, Bob? Okay. Thanks. Um, I I had a lot of difficulty uh, reading this document and trying to understand exactly what element two was about. And and after talking to Mike at length about it, listening to the conversation this morning, and then reading it and rereading it, I think I finally understand it. And and the problem that I had, I think, really just has to do with some language. And that I would like to recommend some different language to describe the Functional Element Characterization Center. I think there needs to be some, it's not really that you're trying to create a set of well-characterized and validated functional elements. It's that you're trying to um, enhance the catalog of candidates by uh, characterizing and validating those functional elements in healthy and disease states. Uh, and that it's, you have to say something in there that it's not enough to show a biochemical assay that is thought or is implied to have functional impact from which one could then infer perhaps an impact on health and disease. There needs to be a, a demonstration of a connection between 
an element that has a biochemical signature of some kind and a functional activity in health, in the healthy state and in disease. And this is not different from what, what I think this um, uh, concept is about. I, I just think the language needs to be clearer so that people who are perhaps at the periphery of the tent or perhaps even outside the tent can really understand your intent a little bit better. Point well taken. Thank you. I mean, for, for example, if you go to um, the uh, What's New page, which is page two, under the functional element characterization centers, you say it's a new activity targeted at validating and characterizing candidate functional elements. Well, I think that really says what it is that you want, whereas on page one, on the overview, uh, I think that that actually gets obfuscated in the statement of the purpose. I mean, I, I guess what, what really helped me understand this functional element characterization and the difference between the mapping, more than anything else, was a model and the model that I used to think this through with BCL11A, how you have a, a, an enhancer site within BCL11A that was identified by ENCODE as one of the catalog of candidate functional elements. You have the locus control region and the globin locus, which had been identified before ENCODE even existed as a, a, uh, both a candidate and a real functional element. And it was the demonstration of a variation in that enhancer binding site, BCL11A, that resulted in a quantitative difference in the expression of BCL11A and therefore a difference in the, uh, the degree to which uh, beta globin switching occurred, resulting in enhanced fetal hemoglobin and an improvement in the uh, sickle cell anemia because of having additional fetal hemoglobin. I mean, that connection, I, I think that's a poster child for what you'd like to see in the Functional Element Characterization Center. Oh, I mean, it's a beautiful transacting, uh, dis um, tr transacting mechanism. I'd like to see hundreds, thousands of those, particularly since the BCL11A1 um, was a GWAS hit. So connecting it to the GWAS, I think, would be an important thing to try to at least suggest, not require, but suggest in the Functional Element Characterization Centers. That's it. That's all I had to say. So I know when I read an FOA, one of the things that really helps me understand what this is all about is the section where they say examples of such research projects could include. That's left out of these concept documents, and <clears throat> so I think the message we're getting is give a serious thought to how those will be framed. Thank you. Aside from the, the sort of the, the, the generalities of getting consented samples, how would, how would the, the use of samples that are specifically consented uh, help, or is that just a, an NIH-wide NIH policy at this point? Is the, is the idea to go back to specific patients, or is that part of this RFA? Or? The idea is the data does not, you don't have to go through dbGaP to get to the data. And to how, the, are the primary how are you going to get to the data then? Through the ENCODE portal, through yeah, so I think I just, just, I think that part is critical. I think keeping this data that's generated by ENCODE as utterly accessible as possible, even if it means giving up some good samples, is, is important. All right, five-second rule is being imposed. Uh, can I get a motion to approve or accept the concept as proposed? Approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. On to number three. I, I had a question about three and four together, and I think this may echo what Eric uh, said earlier, which is, um, and since I don't, uh, I neither create software for analysis or work on the on on databases, is separating the computational analysis expertise 
from the uh, database, uh, in, these, in, to, the data and resources to support analysis. Um, is, is, that a, is that a clear distinction, or is it, should there be more emphasis on the coordination of those two elements? So, Bob, I think this is less about separating out the basic data processing and more about separating out projects that are designed to use the resource in different analyses. And I would point out that this is the way the current ENCODE project is set up. Um, we, we set out some broad areas that people could put in computational projects, either better ways to identify elements, better ways to predict their function, or better ways to look at elements associated with disease. And then we got into investigators that suggested projects like Robert Klein and Shoma Ray Chaudhary saying, I want to see if I can use the ENCODE data for disease, or others looking like Sundas Kellis and uh, Colin Dewey looking to see, I want to, they wanted to learn, are there better ways to map to repetitive elements and so forth. So for the computational analysis, the idea is these are individual projects that are not the core mission of the consortium. Whereas the data analysis center would be doing things that are core mission of the consortium, like defining how the data, how the basic data processing is done, and the uniform data processing is done. Good. That that makes sense, and I, and I think the idea of, of essentially carving out a place for people with smart ideas on how to do specific uh, analyses for specific projects is a good idea. So. Can I pick up? Um sort of that, um, that question. So I think one of the things that ENCODE can be most proud of is this, something you've already highlighted, which is the enormous number of publications that investigators not funded by ENCODE have published, not just referencing ENCODE, but using ENCODE data. That's, I think it's fantastic. Um, so, but when I look at this one, I, then I get, in, in light of that enormous community use of the ENCODE data, I get a little confused because I say, is this an invitation to users of an ENCODE data to apply for funding to do their analysis of ENCODE data? And where's the line? You see where I'm, <laughs> I think you see where I'm going. I mean, I, I um, uh, yeah, so I, I'd love to hear some commentary on what distinguishes the run-of-the-mill ENCODE uh, user from um, the applicant for um, Program 3? I think it's pretty standard, and we've heard it in today's discussion, this tension of how do we bring more people into ENCODE so that we get the best minds participating, and then how do we just generate the resource and leave it to individual investigators to use the resource? We're trying to do both at the same time. And this seemed to be an appropriate balance to bring in a limited number of computational projects that would hopefully illustrate how the data can be used to other users. But yes, there is this tension of we brought everybody into ENCODE. <laughs> you know, that, that's one way to, to twiddle the dial, as Eric would say, where we could say we wouldn't have anybody in this and solely leave it to outside users. This, this is the balance that we're looking at. And I, I'd just like to add that, that um, these uh, groups primarily are, I think I'm not misspeaking, are largely focused on methods development and not just on their favorite research disease or, or project, um, although I think we are open to that in this, in this initiative. And also, by being a part of the consortium, they really are getting uh, in on very early discussions about the data and looking under the hood, as you, if you will, at the data and sort of bringing in an outsider's view about processing data, bringing in specific expertise that's been helpful to, to creating a, a better resource for the community. Uh, Joe? Yeah, I just wanted to comment. Uh, my, my experience with this group, the current group, is that they are, um, they participate very, uh, in a very integrated way, for example, with the mapping centers, although their function is to develop these novel tools, oftentimes during the conversations about uh, what they're doing, an issue will come up, oh, we can use that to validate across all the data sets which ones are outliers, for example. We've got some new approach to do that. So there's a real mixing uh, beyond their own interest with the production groups and ways of, of looking at that data that, that 
that really are fertilized by having them as part of the consortium. Eric, did you want to say something? I find the juxtaposition of investigator initiated and U01 on the same slide sort of jarring, and, and maybe this maybe maybe you're not the right I'm not sure who the right person to sort of make a comment on that is I can understand why you wanted would want to do it that way but but it feels like um, it's investigator initiated all right but the institute is still going to sort of direct the way things happen. And, and, and if uh, I had had a chance to edit the slide I, earlier today, as we were having a discussion, I, I would have. It was already on here. I think I can understand that that's misleading. I think the idea here really is is the ideas from the investigators. We're not saying we want this exact work being done, but it is it is an initiative with set aside funds. I would just add to that that with the current uh, computational analysis programs, pro projects, they are they have a great deal of freedom. And a lot of the cooperative agreement part stems in things like making sure that they follow the consortium practices, that they're sharing their software rapidly and so forth, as opposed to um, the consortium or NHGRI staff telling them they, they need to change their project or this is what it is. They do their projects as they wrote them and as they see. So as you were describing the a function of the of the, these groups. I now got confused on, we actually have three groups doing analysis here, right? We have the those in the production centers, which historically have been pretty strong, and the DAC, and now these investigator-led ones. Now I'm confused about the function of the DAC and the production center analysts themselves. So the, the analysis under the production centers is really just to uh, do quality assessment of their own data. Of course, they're free to publish on their own data. Quite a but lot more than that, I think. I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure. And, and the and the DAC is to bring those data together from the different member, different production centers. That so, so, so the DCC houses, accessions the data, displays the data, and and it gets it into geo right. and so forth. Okay, whereas the DAC, the Data Analysis Center, is involved in the basic processing and harmonizing the data, deciding how that should be done. The DCC actually does the computations. Okay. So, I mean, these are complex data types and many decisions to be made. For instance, we wrestle with what's the best way to display transcriptome data. You could say this is expression by exon, this is expression by transcript, this is expression by gene, and once you've made one of these decisions, which some people will grumble about no matter how you make it, then how do you actually implement that? Again, there's no one best practice, okay? So the DAC is very involved in that part, the, the setting up the basic computation that should be done with each data type and making sure that the data are uniformly processed to maximize the chance of comparison across groups and data type. Go. Lucilla first, then Joe. Yeah, uh, maybe that was not the intent when, when it was written, but the way it appears is that the model of download is still predominantly what will be done in this type of um, project, whereas it might not be the case with very large data sets and having people come and compute where the data are. So, so I wonder if any consideration was given to a, a uh, different kind of setup. In in that case, if having a separate um, coordinating center in the analysis center would be a good thing to do. So are we jumping to number four? Yeah. Right. Yes. Well, it, it is related because this three is uh, assuming everyone will download data, which might not be the case. The model that we use now, which was um, suggested by the investigators as part of their application, is that not only do we have the data at GEO, term of award, but they have the data in Amazon Cloud. And we also have pipe, uh, the uniform processing pipelines at the Amazon cloud. So we're, we think we're offering users both options. They can download the data if they wish, analyze it with any tool they have if they wish. They can use the data in the cloud if they wish. They can analyze it with any tool of theirs or any tool of ours. We're, we're trying to give people as much flexibility as possible. So I apologize if that doesn't come across. Yeah, sorry, my comments related to the next one because we were drifting a bit. 
So let me ask you to clarify how much of Initiative 3 is we want high quality analyses done of all these data that will be produced in 1 and 2 versus we want new methods of analysis being done. Is there a balance there or, or is it trying to do both? I think it's more more focused on new methodologies and new new approaches to analyzing data rather than I've got my favorite data set right. and I want to. You really have to bring something novel and new to this right. that's going to okay. be generalizable, not my favorite pro project. Okay, thank you. Other questions about Initiative Three? Okay, can I get a motion to accept or approve the concept? Second, all in favor, any opposed, any abstentions? Thank you. On to number four. Joe, you said you had a question on, on my, my My question was just some a clarification that this group uh, so additional functions that will have to be taken on that wouldn't be, for example, part of the other other groups, either the production center uh, analysis that happens there or the the, the number three uh, groups would be, you know, interacting with the community now to, to create, to, to, to process their data, to, be, to work with them. That's going to be a completely new function that's embedded in this that really requires a dedicated effort because we do want to capture, there's a lot of great science out there. You know, these tools are now in the hands of many laboratories and, uh, but you need to have standards that are, that are in place and quality checks to, and people that dedicated to that to bring that data in to make the uh, encyclopedia more rich. It's really open for any other comments. I had, I had, I had a question about um, the, the uh, outreach to the community and uh, some of the tutorials and teaching. I've seen there's some good videos on how to use ENCODE data. I think there was an ASHG workshop, which I think was very quickly subscribed to fullness, if, if I remember correctly. I don't know how the registration is going for your June meeting, which is in Potomac. Um, just to, if you could just give, give me some idea about how uh, the outreach and education component of this is going. So, so that um, one was announced just recently, and so uh, that's why I put that shameless plug in. There is still room. Uh, I think we can have up to a couple hundred people that can attend, um, and I, I think uh, we're trying to get the word out for that. Uh, the, yes, you're correct that the ASHG uh, uh, workshops, I think, were sold out very, very quickly. Uh, yeah, so it's fairly short notice for the Potomac meeting, but I, I, I just, I'm just thinking in general uh, maybe some additional uh, efforts with uh, geographical localizations, west, middle, and east, might be uh, considered part of the uh, EDCAC's um, responsibilities. Yeah, I think that's a good suggestion. I'd also uh, point out that we have uh, plans to uh, videotape much of the upcoming users meeting, and we're going to try to put um, many of those sessions uh, freely available online as tutorials uh, to increase use of the ENCODE resources. Great. Thanks. In the slide, you have you expect the DCC and the DAC to function as a, as a single entity. Mm -hmm. So why then are you splitting them up into two funded mechanisms? And are you expected then to, to have pairs of applications come in in a coordinated manner? Yeah, so um, we did, debated this actually at, at great length. Um, we had uh, we felt that the expertise for the DCC and the DAC were sufficiently different than to um, have people up front necessarily come come together. If we have one application that scores incredibly well for the DCC part and not as well for the DAC part, or vice versa, 
and it's more difficult to uh, to come up with a rational funding plan. And so, uh, we certainly like your your feedback on this. We've as I said we we've gone back and forth. It, it has worked well under the current um, plan and a current funding for code. And so we decided to go um, along with that for this round. See. Yeah, I think if they are the same, you could realize some cost savings um, and might be easier to integrate because it's often the case that whoever sets the data analysis environment has to try it out, has to, you know, really know what kind of environment they need to set, get the permissions right and everything. And having two different groups doing that is, is a, a bit of a coordination challenge. I mean, I don't, I don't think we see a lot of duplication of, of effort at this point, um, but we can certainly consider that. I think you're ready for lunch. <laughs> so, <laughs> if there are no further comments, can I have a motion to approve? And a second. All in favor? Second. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Thank you very much, team function or team encode, whatever you're calling yourselves now. Um, so we're going to take a, about an hour break. I want you to please reconvene at 1.30. But before you bolt from the table, this is a council photo day. We need to update the photo that's uh, on the web. So if you could just sit tight. Comfort has a room and a photographer set aside for the picture. So everybody, everybody gets their picture taken. <laughs>